so this is the physical setup I want to use to describe uh, what I want to describe now. So I mean, you've seen this before. I used this setup before to illustrate the difference in the sort of kinetic energy of these two, right? I rolled them down at the same time, and, and the disk rolled down faster because it has less rotational kinetic energy, so it has more translational kinetic energy. Remember that? So what I want to really look at is I don't want to compare. Uh, I want to just look at motion of one object. And um, how would you describe this motion? So if you looked at, um, how do I put it? So if you look at this, um, so I think uh, a lot of people, if I asked, how would you describe motion of this, uh, motion of this ring? A lot of people would say, well, it's a combination of two motions. It has a translation. It has motion that's uh, moving side, kind of sideways. And as it's moving sideways, there's one other type of motion happening um, that's the rotation. Right? How many would have described the motion that way if I asked? Right? OK. Um, all right, so that's not a wrong description. So let me actually uh, work out this one problem. Um, we haven't worked out a lot of rotation problems. Let's just work out this one so that um, you can see an example of using conservation of energy to work out a rotation question. So, um, so this would be the setup. So, ring rolling downhill. I would describe, all right, here's my hill that's inclined at some angle theta. And um, I have a ring that starts out at some height, h. And the question that um, standard, so it starts out at some height h, starts with a zero velocity. And the a standard question I could ask is, when the ring reaches the bottom here, what is the uh, final velocity of the ring? Matt, that sounds like a reasonable question to you. And having seen this setup, it, does it look like I have completely specified the setup? Yeah. So you have the high center center of the ring. So for that one, will the height also be dependent on the part of the bottom? Uh huh. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Let me redraw drawing so that it's uh, clear what I mean. I really should have drawn it this way. So you know, by h, I mean the difference in height. Difference in height from the beginning to the end. Right? That's the reasonable way you would do it if you're trying to avoid any fussy complications, right? OK. Um, does, it, does, this, does this sound like a complete specification of this problem? Or is there anything that I'm missing that I should uh, um, describe before I can figure out this velocity here? Like, do I need to know the mass of the ring? Do I need to know the radius of the ring? I don't need to know the radius of the ring? OK. Um, so I mean, so all right. Let me just write down two parameters that I could have maybe specified. Uh, maybe the mass of the ring and the radius of the ring. Uh, my contention is going to be that uh, I don't need either of them, actually. I don't need either of them. Um, they are going to go away. So, but you know, OK. So this is a more or less a complete question. I have specified everything. And if, you ju if I just give you the number for h, you should be able to calculate this final velocity. Right? Now, how would you do it? So let's say you actually want to do the calculation. How would you set up this problem so that you can figure out this final velocity from knowing all this initial parameter? You do this conservation of energy. So it's a, obviously here, what snapshots I'm using? I'm using this snapshot to this snapshot. And uh, is everyone here convinced that energy should be conserved here? Like you have no reason to think of. Is there friction here? Mm -hmm. Let me come back to that question. Yeah. 
Um, I, I agree that energy is conserved. <laughs> Let me just uh, end there. So we use conservation of energy. Um, conservation of energy. So I've gone through some of the steps now. You know, I convinced myself that energy is conserved. I don't think there's any non-conservative force that's doing any work. Um, I have snapshot one and two. Once I have all of that lined up, then I start by writing down total energy at one of those two snapshots is equal to the total energy at the other snapshot. All right. Um, so at the, I guess I should label my snapshots. At snapshot one, what is the expression for my total energy? MGH, just the potential energy, no other energy? All right, that's good. So let's say total energy at point one is MGH. Maybe this was why some of you might have thought you needed mass. We'll see, we'll continue on. What about the total energy at point two? So you have, let's break down the forms of energy. So you are, what Arjun is saying is that you are going to have translational kinetic energy. Is that all or are there more kinetic, more energy, forms of energy? Asia? Yeah, it's going to have rotational kinetic energy. That's how most of you are going to describe this motion. That when this uh, rolls down from this hill, by the time this reaches the bottom here, it has translational uh, motion, it has velocity, and then it's rotating, right? Okay, um, any other forms of energy at the bottom? No? Okay, if that's it, let me write it out. So this is equal to one half mv squared plus, oh, uh, what's the rotational kinetic energy? one half rotation inertia times angular velocity squared. Um, all right, this is going to be my first difficulty. So I have one equation. Uh, how many unknowns do I have? I have, yeah, I have two unknowns. I don't know my final velocity. I mean, that's what I'm looking for. What else do I not know? Yeah, I also don't know the final angular velocity. They are both unknown. So, and you know, I mean, I, um, I, I, I think I know what I is. This is going to be uh, m r squared, right? Yeah. So that part is fine, but I don't know my final dynamical quantity. Neither the velocity nor angular uh, velocity. So that means I need a, one more equation to be able to actually solve this um, question. What's the one equation that? Um, so, um, so if you are looking at this, you know this is not wrong. I just want you to be fully aware uh, how this particular uh, expression applies in our situation. So, because um, I, it's possible to set up a question in such a way where you cannot use this. Actually, let me demonstrate it. Um, let's see. It's not going to get caught by camera that well, but let me, so. So you are thinking of something that's moving like this, right? Where it's uh, uh, rotating at some particular rate and the velocity matches. Let me uh, show you this motion. See if there's uh, any kind of relationship between the translational motion and the rotational motion. Was there any relationship between translational motion and rotational motion? No, right? Watch again. So, you know, as it's moving at the beginning, that's the portion I want you to look at. There was no relationship at all, right? It was rotating this way, and it was translating that way. So what do you think is the key difference between this motion and this motion? Acceleration. Not acceleration. I mean, you know, all of that is involved. Or, you know, look at this. Like at the very beginning, where it was not rotating at all, but it was still moving anyway, right? So what's the difference between this and this? Not final. I'm looking for a condition, a single phrase that I can say that will distinguish between the two. I'm not looking for any numerical value of anything. Um, I'm looking for a single condition. I mean, if you want to say friction, sure. It's a very particular type of friction. So I mean, even this, 
I would not call this frictionless. Because this table is not a frictionless table. It does have friction. In fact, it, it, look, it might look like I'm trying to make this rotate. Actually, watch this. If I, if I simply push it, I do nothing but push it. So yeah. I guess as long as I'm not throwing it around, I can do it here, too. Um, uh, so when I have this, and you know, it might have looked like before that I was trying to rotate it, but I don't actually have to actively try to rotate it. If I simply push it sideways, it will just naturally rotate on its own. Why is it rotating? I'm trying my best not to apply a torque. Yeah, there is friction. Even in this case, there is actually friction. So even in this case, there is a static friction that's applying, opposing the force, and that's what's causing it to rotate. So in terms of friction, how is this motion that you have seen, nice and simple, different from this motion, the beginning portion of this motion? where there was no connection between rotation and translation of motion. It's a kinetic friction. It's kinetic friction. Or another way to say is this. Here, it was rotating. It was rolling without slipping. The contact point between the ring and the table doesn't actually move. As it, move, as it rotates, this contact point doesn't move. The way it moves, the contact point keeps changing. But the point of contact is not moving. So, so that's uh, what you see when you see a uh, regular rolling. But we call this rolling without slipping. But it's possible for objects to slide rather than rolling without slipping. So this expression that Stephen wanted to use, oops, not this. Um, this expression that Stephen wanted to use, which is actually related to this, we give this a name. We call this. Um, Rolling without slipping condition. So it's when we so you know you have to analyze the situation and figure out for yourself is it gonna roll without slipping? Most of the times it does, but some of the actually uh, quite multiple choice questions you have seen on Tuesday based uh, relied on this. When something is sliding, then it doesn't roll, or it doesn't rotate. So the condition, this condition. Uh, um, constrains these two together. The velocity at, its, at which it's moving, uh, when it's rolling without slipping, is equal to the radius times the angular velocity. And that's the rolling without slipping condition. So for this problem, we can use that. That seems like that's something that holds here, right? So let me write that out. So uh, using all of that, let me plug this in. What the right hand side will become is one half mass times v final squared plus, let me write this all out, one half mr squared times, so instead of omega, I have v over r. So v final over r squared. You'll see that some things cancel out. Actually, this r cancels out the r squared. That's why I actually didn't need the radius r. It cancels out, I don't need it. Um, f comparing left-hand side to this, all the masses cancel out. So that's why I didn't need any mass. Um, so I get an expression that I can just solve for v final in the end. So let me just write. So this is 1 half v final squared. Is this also 1 half of v final squared? Yeah. Oh, OK. So I can simply say all of this is equal to v final squared. So I solve for v final. Um, I end up with a v final is equal to square root of gh. Right? So this, that's how you calculate this final velocity here using conservation of energy. You need to bring in one additional piece of information, and that was this. Now, the reason I brought up this question was uh, I wanted to use this uh, as an opportunity to discuss an alternate way of describing this motion. So I want you to pay attention to what I said about rolling without slipping. That when something is rolling without slipping, oh, yeah, I meant to put this tape on so that you can see if, it's a, if a point is moving or not. Um, let me put this blue tape on. 
so that you can see when something is, uh, see if there's a, another way to describe this motion. So um, this is now rolling without slipping. And you know, I want you to look at carefully as this rolls here, when this point is in contact, as it is continues to move through, this point is not moving until it comes off. What that means is, okay, so this point, while it's in contact, it's a fixed point, it's a stationary point. What that means is I can describe the motion here, motion at this snapshot, as entirely rotational motion. No translational motion. So let me label this snapshot three. I mean, it's the same snapshot here, but let me label it as a snapshot three. And the way I'm trying to describe this is not, um, so snapshot two was this. I had the center of mass that was moving at this uh, um, speed of V final, and the whole thing was rotating as it was doing that, right? This third way I want to describe this, it's going to be, well, I have this point of contact, and I'm going to say that's my center of rotation. And I'm going to describe the entire thing as just the rotation about this point. Should I be able to do this? Is there any problem with the, trying to describe things this way? I mean, this is a point of contact and um, you know, it, it, for this moment in time, this looks, uh, acts like a pivot point. Because this is a point that's not moving, it's a fixed point. So I should be able to do this. And let me show you what you get when you try to do this. So I'm going to write down the same conservation of energy equation again. So I'm going to say um, conservation of energy The left-hand side doesn't change. So for the left-hand side, I still have mgh. This is my total energy at point one. And I want to say that's equal to total energy at point two. Uh, so the way I'm trying to describe it now, I'm not going to have any more uh, translation of kinetic energy. I'm trying to describe this as a pure rotation. Yeah. So when I write down what my total energy on the uh, total energy, I guess at point three. Um, so you know, I might start out this way. You know, say it's a kinetic energy translational kinetic energy at point three plus rotational kinetic energy at point three, and we would say, well, um, the way we are trying to describe it, translational kinetic energy is zero. So all you have left is rotational kinetic energy. So I say, all right, one half i omega squared. And I look at this equation. Um, so I plug in omega from same before. So I'm going to say my omega final. Omega final is equal to v final over r. Um, let's plug it in, see what happens. Um, so um, let me write down the cleaned up version here. MGH is equal to one half, what's the rotation inertia I? Yeah. MR squared, okay. MR squared times that, V final uh, squared over R squared, R squared cancels. And when you get the answer for V final here, and uh, M cancels, and when you get the answer for V final here, you get that V final is equal to square root of 2GH. Hmm, that's not the same answer I got, so I must have done something wrong. Uh, this discretion must not be valid. Turns out that's not the case. I mean, you know, there was nothing wrong with this description, right? I mean, you know, describing this as pure rotation, for this moment in time, that works. Like, there's no reason why that shouldn't work. It's still true that there is a mistake somewhere in this step. Where do you think the mistake was? Rotational inertia, is that what you're gonna say, Isha? Yeah, so 
you have to be more careful with this value of rotational inertia. I want you to think back to this. Imagine the rotational inertia of a ruler when you're spinning it about its center versus when you're spinning it about its end point. Was it different? OK. Rotational inertia of the ring, spinning about its center versus spinning about one of its end point. Is it going to be different? Yeah, it's going to be different. So um, here, I guess the answer is, oh, so we are going to have to have a different rotational inertia. And I guess if you didn't have any shortcut tools, you would have to you know, do the calculation to actually, you know, so some points are right at you know, distance of 0. Some points are at the distance of 2r. You have to do the whole integral around the whole thing to figure out the new rotational inertia. Right? What I want to tell you now is the shortcut. The, this shortcut is given by something called the parallel axis theorem. And actually, uh, we can figure out the formula that parallel axis theorem gives uh, using this setup. So instead of assuming that I know the rotational inertia, I'm just going to, say, going to say humbly that, you know what? I don't know what rotational inertia I have. I have some rotational inertia. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out an answer for free final. And I'm going to try to guess what my i should be so that my final answer is correct. Yeah? So, so let's do it that way. So you know, if you have read about parallel axis theorem in the textbook, great. Um, that's what we are trying to derive using this situation. Or that's what we are trying to guess at. So let me erase all of this. Um, I have to, so I undid a lot of the cancellations that didn't quite work out. All right, so coming back to this expression here, I kept i as just i. It's something we are trying to figure out. Um, so let's just solve for v final. So v final is equal to square root of 2r squared times all of that, 2r squared times mg. H divided by I square root it. That? Yes. All right. So um, from what I was saying before, um, if uh, if we if we choose the correct value of I, what it's going to be is this whole quantity should equal what we had before. This should be equal to gh square rooted. Right? OK, so that means I guess it, this is the only way it's going to work. i must be equal to 2 mr squared. 2 mr squared. So that must be the rotational inertia of this. That instead of mr squared, it's 2 mr squared. So that's not quite a general formula yet, right? So I want to come up with an expression that relates this i to the rotational inertia that you, we used before. So uh, this is actually a special type of rotational inertia. Let me use this symbol. Um, this, we can call it um, i center of mass. What we had here is the rotational inertia of this object about its center of mass. I mean, we weren't paying too much attention to that, but it was. Right? And um, that will be an important special value when we are applying parallel axis theorem. So in the parallel axis theorem, what we are trying to do is we are trying to describe the rotational inertia for any other axis. So any other axis, that's not the axis going through the center of mass, but parallel to the axis going through the center of mass. So I can imagine moving, taking this, move it parallel down to here. That's the axis I'm talking about now. So I want to describe this i as a function of rotational inertia of center of mass. What else should it depend on? If you are trying to describe how the rotational inertia changes as you move this axis parallel to the original axis. R, R as in the radius of the ring, or do you want to give me something more generic? Or by r, do you mean like the distance that I'm moving the axis? Distance. The distance I'm moving the axis, right? I mean, here it's not the case, but I could have moved the axis all the way down here. 
and make this rotate like this, maybe. I mean, it doesn't do that here, but you know. So it's going to be a function of the rotation inertia of the center of mass and the distance that you are moving the parallel axis by. Um, and I guess that's uh, as far as I can write that without actually writing down what I know. Um, so this parallel rotation inertia about this parallel axis, it's given by rotation inertia about the center of mass, right? So I'm trying to break out this 2mr squared into this form. OK, I have mr squared. That's a rotational um, inertia by center of mass. Now, if I were to multiply by 2, that doesn't seem like that's going to give me a general, generalized formula. So I'm going to imagine actually adding to mr squared. So I'm going to add something to this mr squared. And what I'm adding here, well, that's going to be another mr squared. So what I'm adding here is mass times this distance squared. So uh, let me call this actually delta x, sorry. D is too confusing with the diameter. Um, so this n, mass of the object, times the how much you translated the axis squared. So this is what we call parallel axis theorem. Um, so here, you know, it, this, is the, uh, this is my ICN, and this little bit I'm adding is mass times how much I translated the axis. In this case, that's the radius, r. So r squared. That's this. So if you use the correct rotational inertia, then you, you do get the correct result. So this is kind of like a backward way of doing it. But um, so you know, the reason I'm doing this backward is I wanted to highlight to you that when you describe motion in different ways, so you know, motion about the rotation about center of mass, that's great. That's intuitive. Most people do problems that way. And you know, often, that's how you all want to do it. Um, and you know, it makes sense. Do it that way. But some, on some questions, you will have to switch your view from that to some other fixed point that's not the center of mass. Then what you have to keep in your mind all the time is when you change your axis, you are going to be changing your rotational inertia. So uh, if you are automatically plugging in mr squared whenever you see a ring, stop. If you are, so you know, you might have seen in your textbook that the rotational inertia of a rod about its center of mass is ml squared over 12. So if you're automatically plugging that in, stop. Um, you have to know where the axis is. If the axis is through the center of mass, as it was in the formula where you see it, then great, use it. But if your axis shifts, then you have to shift to your, change your rotation inertia. And parallel axis theorem is the theorem that tells you, you know, somebody actually did the rigorous proof. I'm not doing rigorous proof here. Um, so this is the theorem that tells you how you have to change your rotational um, inertia so that uh, when you go through this conservation of energy calculation, that everything works out again. Yeah? And you know, once you have this formula, it kind of makes, I hope it makes intuitive sense. There are two things that this formula is telling you. So it tells you that if you have an object and you want to minimize its rotational inertia, the axis that minimizes it is the axis through the center of mass. Uh, it might go some other way, but it has to go through the center of mass. Because looking at this formula, the moment you start moving away from center of mass, your rotational inertia will just increase. Right? And this is the second thing it tells you. It says that amount that it increases by, it increases by an amount that, um, you know, if this was a point mass, if you imagine shrinking this down to a point mass here, and then, you know, so, you know, here. So imagine shrinking this down to a point mass here. Then the rotation, additional rotation inertia from having the axis here is the rotational inertia of this point mass, which I hope makes some kind of intuitive sense, maybe. So this is one situation where, in rotation, you are, once again, treating center of mass like where the mass is concentrated, as long as you first account for the fact that it's distributed, so you have to, but, yeah. So um, I don't know if, uh, so um, Sam told me there were some questions about this that came up in Tuesday's study group, which means you must have been reading the textbook and uh, working through the problem on your own. Uh, what I'll tell you is that um, this is a very useful formula. 
And it's one of the couple useful things, engineering-wise, that we don't emphasize in this class. There are other things in rotation that I want to emphasize. So, um, so any problem where you might use this, most of the time, you can actually do it this way. Think of your motion, like a motion of center of mass, and rotation about the center of mass, and you can do this question without ever invoking this. So any exam questions, you'll be able to do it that way. The homework question where this came up was where I asked for rotation inertia of some complicated object. And I can just tell you now that I don't think I've ever put that on the exam. Like, I've never put that on the exam. So, and I, I, I mean, I didn't do it uh, consciously now that I think about it, but it's uh, me making, making the unconscious decision that this is useful, interesting. If you're an engineer, you'll probably have to know this. This is like Young's modulus, this is, which is another thing we don't cover. But this is the first semester of physics. Um, think uh, if I start giving you questions where this is a central part of the question, it gets too difficult. And that's, so that's not going to be on the exam. Yeah? So any kind of question that I might put on the exam, now you might be able to do it this way, like work out the dynamics by figuring out the new rotation inertia, use the parallel axis theorem, and work it out that way. Like that would work. But um, what I'll tell you is that um, um, for every problem that can be done that way, you can also do it this way. <laughs>